Hello and welcome to Davy Forum's podcast for Monday the 28th of January. And joining me on this edition are Kaz Hallow. You may want to close your eyes for this. Ed Selly. We're refueling without stopping. And Steve Withers. Never judge a girl by her Gucci boots. I kind of had a feeling you were going to go for that line, Steve. Mm. don't know why. So uh, I got my new car last week. Yeah, we know. It's all over social media. (laughs) I don't care if you've got a Maserati or a Lamborghini. Don't care. (laughs) And Steve has a fridge with wheels to prove it. So, uh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, that's We kind of know you don't get cars, Steve. You know, we have seen what you drive. It must have been a challenge going, you know, ha- having to give up your horse and and go go for the internal combustion engine. So <laughs> I haven't got an uh, internal I, combustion engine. I've got a Steve, battery. Steve, you're yes, shouting. Yes, you do have you do have an internal combustion engine. You, you don't yes, have a full I know, electric I know, car. I know, I know, I know. So anyway, I'd, yeah, go on social media, ggz underscore five six five. You want to see photos of it? Um, if you're interested, many, Steve. Many photos. <laughs> I, I, hey, I haven't even done the videos yet. There's videos and <laughs> vlogs and all sorts coming. So, but this is the final one. So this is the this is the forever one, which is. Oh, why I, I'm glad that this is continuously being put on. Believe that when this I is see my it. Final one. <laughs> no t- t- right, two things. You you do realise that you're setting yourself up for uh, you know for elements beyond your control here. Well, obviously, First there's all, that, there's that side. So if it goes wrong, or no, no, it comes no, no, up no, a fault, no, 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 what, no, what's more, what's more pertinent is this is my lot. It, it that means it rules out if Ford does something truly spectacular, you're going to go, nah, not for me, not at any stage. I've got no, this no, no, one. no. Hang on, hang on, hang on. This is my forever car. I didn't say it's going to be my last car. This is my forever car. This is the one I'm going to hang on to for quite some time. I haven't said at any point that this is my last car. Are you saying on record that you could have two Mustangs? Yes. I would need a new house and double garage. Oh, and... <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that there were some provisions there. I'm I'm simply saying that there are um uh that, that there are there are any number of external factors. Prince that... Philip, for example, could be a major issue if he's driving near you. Well, you'd have to be quite a lot further north. You'd be near Balmoral for that to be a problem. Yeah. Now I'll tell you another car news. Obviously, last last week I was discussing the possibility of uh the Megane RS. My tame mechanic. Uh, sent me the uh, parts price list for the Began RS. And I don't mean it's going to break. I mean parts like brake discs and stuff like that. And I can safely say that I'm not <laughs> going to bother with that at all. I simply do not understand but how could anything... you um could you not get a lease deal that covers mechanicals as well? I'm sure they do them. Uh, well, you can get ones that include servicing, but as you might expect, because parts cost an absolute fortune, they're in no way, shape or form cost effective. But, but in, three isn't... Years, in three years, because I'm assuming they come with six port Brembo's the same as the Mustang, so in, in three years, I doubt you're going to wear at even 5% of the pads on those. So, you know, there well, is that side. Hang on a second, I've had I've had to do complete do all the pads on the ST. <laughs> after, Jesus, um, already? All right, yeah. Okay. I live right for starters. Let's be clear about this. Before everyone just assumes that I drive around with my hair on fire, Milton Keynes is extraordinarily hard on vehicles because essentially there are two throttle positions off and on, and you essentially you hammer it up to a certain speed and then you step on the brakes to get to the next roundabout and you rinse and repeat several hundred times. It, it's not conducive to you know. If, I mean, I know that. I mean, round where you are, Phil. You know, largely speaking, the the you know, provided that you avoid you know collisions with Hadrian's Wall, you're fine. And Steve never exceeds 17 miles an hour, so he's also fine. But nonetheless, conditions for me are a little bit more challenging. So you do you, consumables are consumed: tires, brakes, shocks, springs, etc. You get through them. Do not buy a used car from Milton Keynes. <laughs> Engine brake. <laughs> Yeah, that's just what I was going to say. Yeah. Throttle control and engine braking. Engine brake. What do you well, doing? I use that. I use that as well, but that's because I brake like a touring car. I, I'll tell you. That's... I'll tell you what's a, an absolute superb feature on on this must, new Mustang is the rev matching on downshift. So I got a manual this time. It's absolutely brilliant, especially with that exhaust and the pops and the crackles and the bangs. The only thing is though, coming up to traffic lights and you're doing that in the car. to change gear. <laughs> and the car does that, and it does the auto rev match, and it sounds like you're challenging the guy next to you to a race. That's the only issue. But other than that, it sounds absolutely And amazing. you are, in fact, only doing that nine times out of ten. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anyway, right, let's, for Withers' sake, let's let's. Yeah, yeah, on. let's talk about something else. So, so you've been up to Steve that's interesting and non-car related? 
Uh, not much, unless you count what we're going to be talking about later anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it for the week. Hang on, am I, audio-wise, does this sound better? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. we can hear well, you. Well, for some reason, I had to re-site, log into everything on Skype, and um, it reset everything, including the audio settings. Ooh. Uh, you, may, you may want to check your passwords and stuff, then, if that's the case. Yeah. Then if you decide to have some personal time, make sure the webcam ain't running. <laughs> 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 I, I, yeah, I, I, I know there's some weird people out there, but who would want to watch Steve on a webcam doing that? You don't want to watch Steve, you simply want to tell Steve that you have a recording. Oh, right, oh, yeah, the blackmail yeah. angle, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> but then, is anybody interested? Well, I'm sure that Steve oh, would be yeah. interested in it not being in the public domain. <laughs> yeah, uh, right, well, okay. Let's move on before we start getting into trouble. Uh, Ed, what have you been up to? Uh, I have been. Uh, it's been been a relatively just just an orderly week. I had to do a fit. Uh, one, my son's best friend. He had his fifth birthday party yesterday at a trampoline park, um, which was very loud. It was a good metaphor for life, though, because lots of really keen, excited children were sent onto the field of trampolines, and then just a load of broken, weeping children came back off again about <laughs> half an hour later. As a metaphor for what life is, I think that's pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was all fine. Um, Mind had a it's... bunch of snowflakes, aren't they? Kids nowadays. I mean, they're wrapped up in cotton wool. And I mean, when we were kids, do you remember the witch's hat on uh, playgrounds? Do you remember playgrounds that were solid concrete underneath the the stuff yes, like slides I, I and, do, and all the rest of it? And I, I, I didn't do us any harm. It's as well, that's that's open to debate. It, there's a certain <laughs> level of Darwinism to it. I don't necessarily regard a, a, a little a little bit of health and safety here and there as being as being necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> but um, no, I mean that's all that that was all fine. Uh, today I have been um, doing the the photos for the reviews that are coming up. Um, one of the products in question is 34 kilos out of the box. And it's 34 kilos, an incredibly dense size box. Well, he did say you needed some exercise, Ed, so that's that's well, definitely... true. But if anyone complains about the lack of exciting angles in photography, <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> I know the feeling. They can uh, address uh, uh, they can address their comments the nearest loo and flush them because <laughs> but there was just just no way of um, of doing anything interesting with it. So that that's fine. But yes, um, but I'm afraid it's not exercise in the conventional sense, is it? It's standard reviewer thing. So we're all say as a, as a general level rule of thumb you can spot audio reviewers because they are relatively unfit but their deadlift skills are spectacular <laughs> um, and, and you can spot tv reviewers a mile of because we are experts at the krypton factor we can fit things into boxes that you never thought could fit because i've just i've just repacked this panasonic fz802 this afternoon just before we came on to do this and uh, uh it's been out of the box for so long i had completely forgotten how to put it back in the box um and that was a challenge do you see. not take photos as it comes out? No, hell no. Oh, bollocks to that. Hell no. I, no. I do. Well, I, I, got no habit, I got into the habit of doing that with record players, because as you might imagine, they can you can get that very, very wrong. But I will say, the record player that's in this clutch of reviews, I'll probably forget to mention this in the copy, but it has lovely packaging. It can only go together one way. So provided that you take the bits out in order, they go back in in the same order, and then it just closes up, and it's wonderful. And yeah. Other turntable manufacturers should look at that and go, ooh, and and sort of take that to heart. So, yeah, yeah. that was good. I mean, normally TV boxes, Steve will back me up on this, they're normally rectangular, like a TV. So normally they're quite easy to put back together. you just got to figure out how the... Uh, the, you know the padding inside and, and and so on goes together. The the FZ eight hundred two comes in a short and long box, so it's far longer and wider yeah. than the TV is, which makes it really. It's like what's going on here. So it's really it, it was a bit difficult to put back together because I wasn't I sure how them. how much I had to had to take the stand to bits because sometimes you have to take them all to bits and then other times you just take have to take it off the back of the TV. So it was trying to figure out if I had to take everything off or if I could just take it off the back of the TV and then how it went round in the box. It's I have really a certain difficult. level of animosity towards Mr. Harlow because he doesn't even have to rewind things after he's watched them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but as, as we'll discover, I think uh, Kaz needs a set of glasses with sc- different screens in each eye with different programmes running. I would wonder, I mean, I don't know whether you guys remember it, but there was a film, Wings of the, the Apache. Oh, yeah. Also yeah. I, I Firebird. Yeah, he uh, Nicholas Cage basically is if you wanted 
Nicolas Cage to ever be a pilot. It was just Nicolas Cage being himself in a pilot school. And he was learning how to fly an Apache. And he was amazing at it. In his own words, I am the greatest. And um, he found out that he couldn't do it with the optical lens down, which gives a different view to one eye, because he had, as you said, eye dominance. So they, they have him out training with that. But it did make me think whether maybe you could flip down, like I could have Netflix in one eye, and I could have... Uh, now TV and the other, or Netflix and Amazon. Although there's nothing good on Amazon, but well, and then you know. drop it down to a mono a mono signal for each one in one ear, and yeah, one in the other. Exactly, exactly. For those, I'm sure that that wouldn't induce a migraine at all. Yeah. Uh, I, I imagine it would be just perfect. I got two hemispheres in my brain, haven't I? I, I, don't, I don't know how you watch as much as you do, Cass. Yeah. I really don't. <laughs> I don't know when you sleep. I honestly don't know when you sleep. I don't think he does sleep. No, I think so. I have. Are you like the guy? Yeah. It's like Fight Club, isn't it? You're just watching. You're, yeah. There's another. There's another version of you watching films all night long while you think you're asleep. <laughs> yeah, I think it's something like that. I've gone to bed with it on my phone and my headphones in, and I I swear at some point I must have fallen asleep. I don't. I don't really notice. But um, <laughs> but yeah, there's there's a there is yeah there there are only so many hours. Of so Kaz is now subconsciously reviewing Netflix. Stuff yeah, in his well, I, sleep. Wish I, I wish I did with some of it. I mean, my, you, you guys have to move TVs and lift boxes, and you, I, I appreciate how bad that is when, when the TV gets shifted here or when they deliver something here. But you don't have to watch some of the stuff I have to. Watch. Right. Okay. I think I think, have to I, think watch it. I think that at some point for a week later on this year, we're going to have to exchange jobs. Sure. <laughs> just just sure. for shits and giggles. Okay. So I, least... I want I want audio. Rev- I want ads. Final audio <laughs> review. It's got to be a week where all of the shows decide to release on a Friday. So, so I had a week where there were three TV shows all coming out on a Friday and two Netflix movies. Yeah, but well, you can guarantee the Netflix movies are going to be crap. So they, there's, there's that review done yeah, already. You know, what's interesting with them is that they've got ridiculous numbers. So the numbers for the, one of the worst. Claim Net- that, oh, you mean our numbers? No, our numbers. <laughs> People yeah, actually are reading this, and I think a part of it is if you look on IMDb, only like four people have reviewed it. You, you can't get critics to to write ex, like official <laughs> reviews of Netflix stuff because it's just that's below my pay grade. <laughs> so, so I think it gets it's really popular. Uh, so I can't not review the dross. Yeah, so, absolutely. So watch one, watch one th- this week, which was like a four out of ten. People yeah, are you mean, uh, all over that review. Ola. Oh yeah, I, mean, I was going to watch it, and I looked at your review and thought maybe not. No, <laughs> yeah, I have to I say, know, I, was I looked at the cast list and thought definitely not. <laughs> I, I mean, a friend friend of mine said that looks quite like switch your brain off nonsense. I mean, it's I just described to him the opening scene, which involves uh, Johnny Knoxville, a blue pill, and uh, a crack team of assassins. Is Johnny okay. Knoxville wearing his grandpa? Prosthetic. No, Johnny Knoxville was a trained assassin in the scene. <laughs> okay, it was the most absurd thing you've ever seen. That's the most absurd casting since they did. Use, Denise Richards played a, a nuclear physicist, and <laughs> the world is not enough. Yeah, you know, said again, Doctor Christmas or something, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Christmas Christmas Jones. Jones. Yeah. So he comes twice once a year, which yeah, is yeah, coming yeah, yeah. from the beginning of the film. <laughs> like and, and, that joke you know what? That? That's not actually that crazy casting for for a, a franchise with pussy galore. It's, I mean, this is this is just absurdist. It's got a sniper who. I mean, you've got you've got a team of assassins, and one of them's a sniper. Uh, so wh- why do you need the other four? And and how do they split their pay up? Also, Matt Lucas is the uh, supervillain of the show. <laughs> that that should tell you absolutely everything. Basically, you know, as you've replaced me now. Assassin. This is, da- this is dangerously coming on to the point where it's so bad it sounds like I might have to watch <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, no. <laughs> I was just Cass, thinking that. Just all the shit so that we don't have to. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Right, so we... so many people say that to me. Yeah. Well, that's your job. Tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, except for a week coming up in the year where, I yeah. don't know, I might give it a go. But I might have to do it from the position of reviewing season two of something or season three of something when I've never watched any of the preceding <laughs> ones. Like, it's a bit hard to keep up with what's going on. 
<laughs> right, I think we need to do some uh, podcasting. Right, so uh, current competitions. Uh, who's the victim this week? Uh, let's have cards. Cards, you can tell us all about them. Sure, you can win uh, Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte on Blu-ray. Um, you can win Opera on Blu-ray. So Hush Hush closes on 1st of February. Opera closes on 3rd of February. We can win a GT Omega Pro Racing office chair. you got a bit longer till the 20th of February there. What is a pro racing office chair? I was about to say, is it? Does it have one angle, or does it have a, a primary focus on being for racing games, or is it an office chair that simply you could attach a six-point harness to <laughs> and race around for whatever office. reason you were you were worried? I about. think it's it's like uh, in that Mission Impossible film where Simon Pegg is playing a video game and then his boss comes up to him. So I think it's an office chair, which you can use for work, but when your boss isn't look, looking, you can play a racing game and feel like you're in uh, a Mustang. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, well, why not? Good luck to all entrants. <laughs> all competitions open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. And do we have any previous competition winners? We do. We've got a, a bunch of Blu-rays won before. Uh, Dark Clock won The Nun on Blu-ray. Uh, that's not a good film. <laughs> Mighty Babies 2 won final score on Blu-ray. Again, this is punishment coming to you. And <laughs> Base 13 won Kin on Blu-ray, which is worth a watch. Okay. So, so one, one out of three. three. <laughs> final okay. score, the one with Dave Batista is at it? West Ham. Yeah. Is, is he in England in an English football game? Yes, he's at, he's at, he's at the Olympic <laughs> Stadium, isn't he? Yeah, he, uh, to be fair, I, I, I had fun with that in a kind of a diehard in an English football stadium way. But it was it was stupid. And it does was, he stop to eat a pie at any stage? <laughs> Have a bovril. He doesn't, he doesn't, and he doesn't play football. And Does he ever say anything like, come and have, I'll have you slags on my heart. Come and have a go if you think you're hard enough, all that sort of stuff. He doesn't you're try going home in an English he's ambulance? A, Thankfully, he's American. He doesn't try and be British. <laughs> Excellent. Right, uh, that's competitions and what we've been up to. We'll be back in a sec with Hardware News. Okay, so Hardware News, uh, myself and Steve were out of the country this week <laughs> over in Amsterdam. Briefly. Uh, briefly. It was brief. Um, I didn't think I was going to get to the venue, to be honest with you, because I sat in the runway for about 40 minutes. Well, not the actual runway, on the tarmac for 40 minutes at Newcastle. Beautiful sunny day in Newcastle, but seemingly it was snowing quite heavily um, in Amsterdam and uh, there were restricting flights coming in. So nearly didn't get there, but did in the end. And I, I believe you were a little bit delayed as well getting there as well, uh, Steve. Yeah, you were about five or ten minutes. But in fairness to Schiphol, you know, the amount of snow that was coming down there would have brought <laughs> throw to a standstill. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> anyway, anyone in southern England, it would have been a disaster. It would have been front page news and all over the yeah. all over the news. But anyway, uh, so we were there for Philip's launch event. We have uh, hinted that this was coming up uh, for the last few weeks. Um, so this was their opportunity. It was a TV launch. Uh, they didn't launch anything else other than their TVs. So we got two new OLED models. Um, and we also got a lineup of LED LCD TVs. The big news story was obviously Dolby Vision. Um, we kind of hinted that this was going to happen. Um, I think uh, when we interviewed Danny Tack back at the, the tail end of last year on the podcast, he kind of hinted at the fact that there was going to be some news coming up and it was it was more likely going to be Dolby Vision, which they have added. They've added Atmos as well. Although the, uh, the speakers in the TV, there's no upward firing speakers or anything like that, but it will decode um, yeah, Atmos. Yeah, psychoacoustic yeah, Atmos, like yeah. on the LG TVs, basically. Yeah, uh, but it will decode Atmos signals and so on, which is which is. And nice it can send have. it, obviously, the good thing is it can send it back via ARC to yeah. your Atmos receiver or soundbar if you've got one. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So uh, lots of nice features on there. I guess um, let's cover the LED LCD stuff first, Steve, because um, there was, there's a couple of interesting TVs there. But the main thing for me is the fact that there's Dolby Vision on uh, these TVs. So that's a dynamic metadata system, which means that it asks the TV what the TV is capable of doing, and then it makes sure that the tone mapping matches what the TV is capable of doing. Now, if you have a, a high-end OLED TV, which is where Dolby Vision has been uh, up, up to now, it's been on the higher-end TVs, there's not as much need for that. Obviously, OLEDs don't go as bright as, as LED LCD TVs, so there is a bit of uh, you know, matching up to the panel and what the panel can do, but mainly the manufacturers choose how they want to do the tone mapping as well on, on the higher-end TVs. When you get down into the lower reaches of the ranges, mid-range and below, you really are um, pushing 
the technology. Uh, and this is where Dolby Vision can really make a big difference. And it's going to be mm. interesting this year to see just how big a difference it can make. Because Dolby have been boasting about this for a long time, but we haven't had the opportunity yet to see it on a true, truly budget aimed TV, uh, which is what we're going to do with the Philips range. So I'm really interested in seeing just how well it can perform when the peak brightness is restricted and when the capabilities of the TV are not great. Exactly what does the Dolby Vision do? Uh, with its yeah. with its dynamic uh, tone mapping, how does it actually work out? I think that's going to be really interesting, Steve. It is. I think. I think. I've got to say. I mean, obviously, Panasonic uh, slightly beat Philips to the punch because Philips weren't at CES when they announced the GZ GZ two thousand, which was the first TV publicly announced that had both um, Dolby Vision and HDR ten plus. But what impresses me with the Philips lineup is that they're going they're going to have Dolby Vision and HDR ten plus. On ninety percent of their lineup, so yeah. as you say, for that means that it's going to be going down to mid and, and lower range TVs where these dynamic data formats can actually add real value. Plus, you know, you've got both, so you don't have to worry about you know which one wins or anything like that. You, you, you've got both covered. I think um, you know, for, for my money, that's going to that's a big difference because up until now, as you say. Um, Dolby Vision, in, I mean, HR10 Plus hasn't been used that extensively, but Dolby Vision in particular has been almost exclusively used on higher end flagship TVs, where most of the time it can't add that much value because those TVs are already very effective at tone mapping and already have quite high brightness levels anyway, peak brightness levels. But now we're going to get a chance to see what these dynamic metadata formats can actually do on less capable TVs. Um, and certainly the demo that we did get with one of their sort of lower end tellies looked pretty good considering yeah, it did. Uh, the price point that was being uh, pitched at. So yeah, I think you're right, Phil. I think it's going to be really interesting this year. Although it'd be fair to Panasonic, they haven't announced their full range no, yet, no, so we don't know absolutely. if they are I'm, how they far might well be doing range, something yeah. very similar as well. And I'm sure other manufacturers are also probably taking note and have got other plans of along similar nature. But, um, but yeah, yeah, it was just that Phillips are the first ones to announce the full lineup, so yeah, um, yeah. they get they get bragging rights on that one. <laughs> they do absolutely. Uh, the other interesting product was the one. Now, um, I've read some of the comments, and some of the comments are fair enough. You know, it, there is quite the jokes. I yeah, yeah, there, there is, and and uh, bits and pieces in there. And yes, it is a marketing exercise, but um, I do think Phillips are onto something because I've certainly mentioned it to you recently, Steve, and it's it's things that we were going to look at what, during the quiet period before the big TVs come this year was to to have a look at you know where where are we with uh, mid range TVs because. The thing I get asked all the time from my friends and family and, and associates and so on, they know what I do for a job. And the first thing they say is, what's a good TV for £500? And the number of times I get asked that. And it's like, I don't know, because we don't look at that area of the market. We look at mid-range and above, and that's you know that's what people want to talk about on the internet. The problem with £500 and below is people don't read reviews. They go and buy... That's a... That's a, a uh, a purchase that people make without looking at reviews. It's it's they're going to Tesco, they'll buy a Technica TV for five hundred pounds, or they're going to Carries and they'll, they'll get because they're driven by price. And it's something that, that certainly I've never really considered um, because I've been looking at mid range and above TVs. You know what do you get for your money at that price point? And I think Philips the one idea. I don't think it's going to be five hundred quid. By the way, it'll be a bit more than that. It's it's not going to be the budget, but it's also not going to be a flagship. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. But it got me thinking again. You know what do you get for your money at that level of the market? You know I'll what is the quality what, like? Just like you, um, my father-in-law wants to spend up to five hundred pounds on a new TV, and in fact, I think he was shocked at how much you could get uh, in terms of screen size for that. Money because you've got like 55 inches, that's a bit big. But there's a the Philips TV, I think it's a 6840 or something, or 41. Um, but it's uh, stonking value. Uh, for 42 inches, like 300 quid. So there's some great, I mean, high sense as well. I've got some cracking value TVs in that yeah. price range down in that sub 500 bracket. But you're right, we don't get to see that many. But when we do, uh, from the quality manufacturers, I should stress here, not the people who sell TVs in Sainsbury's, but the kind of, you know, the manufacturers that I would consider to be good manufacturers who do offer ranges in that lower price point sometimes I, i've been genuinely impressed by the performance levels of tvs that have been what we would consider to be entry level or, or you know budget models um so yeah and, and philips in particular have along with hisense have been doing some uh, sterling work uh, at the lower end of the market so if they're going to be bringing some of these features i mean looking at what they were talking about doing uh you're looking at you know dolby atmos dolby vision hdr 10 plus uh, android tv going down to to mid-range and lower mid-range TVs, 
then um, then they're going to have some uh, some absolutely cracking uh, cracking sort of budget options available to consumers. Uh, I think we did see one. He didn't use Android, did it? He used um, Safi, I think they call it. Yeah. But otherwise, the specs wise, I thought bloody hell, that's that's a really well specified TV yeah. for what is a budget model. That was the one they were demoing Dolby Vision on, I think actually. And I was thinking, you know. That that's that's gonna you know they priced that right that's gonna sell like hotcakes. <laughs> yeah, and and the other thing is AI. AI is going to be big this year. It was yeah, big at, over the shop. Yeah. It was it was big at CES. It's going to be all over the shop. Um, you know, asking your TV to do certain things and all the rest of it, and and it can be useful. Um, and it's interesting it's, again to see that that's in the the sort of entry level and and above price points as well. So you get lots of features in there. It'll be interesting to see what they're like when we get them in for review. And this is a, another thing. Um, to get these TVs in for review, very few manufacturers send out anything under the flagship TVs, Steve. Um, oh, these days, no. They, you know, they don't do it because we've been told in the past, you know, if it gets a bad review, it basically kills the model. And, and that's why they don't do it. Um, because all, the margins are already so so small. Um, so these are certain manufacturers. I'm not going to name names, but you know we've been told in the past. I'm not sending that TV out because if it doesn't get a good review, <laughs> it basically kills the set, um, which is unfortunate. And it, it, but you know we're gonna we're gonna have a look at it. We're gonna see what we can manage to do this year in terms of. Uh, you know the lower price point TVs. Um, see if people are interested for a start. You know if you are interested in seeing these and reading about these, then leave a comment in the in the comment section under the podcast, uh, whether that's on YouTube or on the forums. Um, should we be covering, you know, a thousand pounds and under uh, in more detail? Should we be looking at more TVs at that price point? Are you interested in it, um, or should we just concentrate on the on the flagship uh, and mid range models that we have been doing for the last few years? Where where do people want to see us uh, pointing our resources? Because, uh, like I had said last week, you know we only have a certain number of slots every year um, to fill up in terms of reviews, and I guess we'd we'd rather bring you stuff that people are interested in and is going to be um, of a certain quality rather than reviewing lots of things at the same price point that they don't really do a hell of a lot to be honest. So let let's know your thoughts on that one. Uh, so wrapping up on Philips is the OLED TV, Steve. Um, interesting products. Nothing to really shout about here because they're very, very similar to the 803 and 903. In fact, one of them is a replacement for the 803, and that's the 804. Um, <laughs> and it comes in two designs. So there's the 804 and the 854, identical panels, identical picture quality. The only difference is the design aesthetic. So one of them yeah. has a has a, a, a traditional stand, and the other one has the two... Um, Two small feet where the the panel kind of sits uh, really low down on your TV cabinet surface. The other one sits a little bit higher, so you can get a sound bar uh, and underneath swivels. the screen. And it swivels, it's yeah. A bit of a novelty these days. <laughs> God, I've got to say, I thought the uh, I thought the designs of their new TVs were really good. Some really attractive looking tellies in that lineup. I was I was quite impressed by that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, you mentioned AI, so obviously a lot of their TVs use Android. Uh, they'll be using Android Pi. Um, we're coming soon, I think, later this yeah. year. Plus, obviously, there's Google. I think Google, well, Google Assistant obviously built in. Plus, it works with uh, Alexa. Amazon. Uh, um, and they, they, they did. We did ask the question about um, um, AirPlay and HomeKit, and they said they're in discussions with uh, with Apple at the moment. So it looks like that could well be added later in the, in in the year as well. With a bit fingers crossed. So the only thing it doesn't have really in terms of features. Uh, that I can think of, and something we discussed on the CES uh, podcast not so long ago, uh, is there's no HDMI 2.1. Yeah, and I asked Danny about that. It's in the vi- it's in the video interview if you're interested in, in seeing his full response. But basically, um, the response from Danny is they, do- they don't need it at the moment. Um, they've looked at it. Um, they could have brought it in. They could have waited till the, the chips were ready, which they're, they're about ready now. They could have added it in, but there's no content that wants it at the moment, um, which is fair enough. And it's it's the same as what Panasonic said as well, you know, um, yeah. that what are you going to watch on it that can't all be delivered in, in one way or another? Because uh, the Philips sets this year will have low latency. So they've added that in. So Danny was saying it's going to be 20 milliseconds for input lag, which gets them in the same Big ballpark. Improvement. Big improvement. That's on a Russia. huge improvement because it was 40 
Yeah, um, it was forty odd. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's a big improvement this year. So low latency is in there, input lag uh, reduction is in there, um, and anything else that they think they can add, I, I suppose they can add onto the existing chipsets um, if if they absolutely have to have it, like variable refresh rate or whatever. Um, but basically, what he was saying is we don't need it at the minute, and that's fair enough because. The only things that really matters is for 8K and for high frame rate, and neither of those are going to come in the next 24 months, 48 months, uh, sorry, 36 months um, before you even see any of that. I, I don't know of any broadcasters or any content producers who are thinking about high frame rate. Um, I don't know if you've no, heard anything, Steve, from not, the PDA or whatever, peak. but no. Not, not a peak, no. I don't think that's coming anytime soon. Um, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, it'd be great if it was, but it's not. Yeah, so it's like uh, everything else. It's another, you know, tick in the box that people might want to make, but actually you don't really need it. Um, and I don't think it's, you know, there, there's a lot of people making a big things about it on the forums and on the video comments and all the rest of it, but actually you don't really need it at this moment in time. If you're future-proofing for the next six years, I, even then I think given where 8K is at the moment and given where high frame rate is at the moment, I think give it, give it six years, it's maybe just starting to come to market by then. Because I, mm -hmm. I certainly haven't seen anything that indicates it's coming any sooner than that. Because the thing with high frame rate is obviously you're doubling the frame rate, you're doubling the amount of stuff you've got to send. You know, yeah. the, the, it means either for broadcast purposes, I don't know if they could even broadcast at high frame rate. Um, certainly not uh, terrestrially. Uh, it might might mean maybe satellite could do it. Um, and then you know, it was, that means you need new kit, a new um, satellite box. Or it could be via um, streaming, which is the more likely solution. But again, that means you have to have a sufficient bandwidth for that. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 something that's going to take time to a deliver and b roll out. Uh, and and it, when it does, it's obviously going to be primarily for sport events. So I can see why someone like Sky might want to you know push it initially. Uh, but yeah, I've, I haven't heard a peep about HFR from anyone um, at all. And in fact, yeah. even things like HLG is taking its time, isn't it? So. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't expect it to be anything much in the next yeah. five years. And we've asked the analysts out there as well. There was uh, Paul Gray was at the um, at the Phillips event. Now Paul has been on our podcast years past, and um, he works for a company IHS, I think they're called. And um, so he looks at the market really closely because obviously manufacturers and so on go to him and ask him where where things are in the market and so on. And he had some really interesting figures to show. Um, they basically show that that Western Europe is uh, in terms of UHD uptake, we're outpacing the rest of the planet at the moment in time mm. when it comes to uptake of large screen TVs and uh, channels that are broadcasting in UHD and so on. So that was really quite interesting. But again, asked the question about uh, you know new technologies coming on like micro LED and so on. I mean, he was saying exactly what what we've thought uh, is is the case, and that's it's it's a good five years away. Um, you know, to get the manufacturing right, to to be able to cut the glass in a certain way, to get around things that might happen with with the technology and so on. So, yeah, I think it's easy on the internet to get carried away with new technology coming and all the rest of it, and to you know, on forums to talk about it, and it is exciting stuff. But I think we need to manage expectations a little bit, especially with HDMI 2.1. It's not a, it's not as big a deal. Uh, as you think it is at this moment in time, because for the main things that is being introduced for, we're not going to see content for it. For yeah, I mean that that format, that standard's been designed, to, you know, to be good for the next twenty years. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. don't get, you know, you don't need it right now. You know, it's it's for it's for decades. It's designed to cover anything we could think of TV wise for the next twenty years. Uh, and so you know, bear that in mind when you're thinking about HDMI two point one. It's not really you can do everything we need right now via two point zero B. So yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. So if you want to find out more about Philips and you haven't been looking at the AV Forums homepage, then there is uh, stories up there. Uh, Andy's put up uh, all the new stories, all the details, all the specifications of the models. You can click on the models and go through the uh, the product pages on AV Forums and uh, you can see all the specs as we know them at this moment in time. And if you want to see the video, the video's there on YouTube and it's also on the homepage as well. Um, I think it's about 20 minutes long. It's got four interviews in there um, covering all the different aspects, not only of the Philips stuff, but also... Um, uh, Bowser and Wilkins is in there, so Andy from Bowser and Wilkins is, is uh, gives you a quick demonstration of the soundbar, and we've also got Paul Gray, who I've just mentioned, who is uh, talking about the future of TV and, and so on. So quite an interesting little video there. If I don't see so myself, I'm going to have a look, look at it. Right, Ed's been dying to do this for months now. Uh, we're <laughs> finally going to get round to it. Um, right, I'd like the record to state very clearly here that you asked me to do it, 
I had no difficulty with doing it, but it wasn't something I pitched to you. You requested it. I delivered. Yeah. This is this, this, some, this is him so trying to ways, out of it. No. This is in, it's so in in it. I I make no bones about the fact, and I make no bones about the fact in the piece um, that I have some issues with this part, this 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 part of the industry. But um, I, in some regards, think that I ghost wrote this for you. <laughs> All right? Right. So well, I'm... well, at the end of the day, AV Forums exists for its members, uh, its forum members, its readers, and so on. And all we are interested in doing, we take no, we've got no manufacturer bias. We've got no bias when it comes to technologies and all the rest of it. We try to be completely down the middle. But there are areas of the industry that do make us wince and do make us think, oh, my God. And and I think it's really important that yes, there is a humorous side to this, and and it's nice to see that the the thread has gone that way, um, and that people have taken it in in the manner it was intended, and that's to have a bit of a laugh at how silly things can get when it comes to audio reproduction and you know techniques and cabling and all this kind of thing, not only audio but video as well, um, and I think it's it's important to say right from the start that the intention of these these pieces are to educate and to point out where you might want to look twice and ask pertinent questions when it when you see certain products and some of the claims that products come with i mean the one, the one that had me completely and utterly baffled was the box that cost tens of thousands of pounds to ground your equipment the grounding box is a mystery one do you know what i've actually heard a system with the grounding box in Unfortunately, I haven't heard the same system without the grounding box in, so I can't tell you what, if anything, (laughs) the grounding box was doing. I mean, it's beautifully finished. If you want a wooden box full of posh gravel, which I think is what's in there, um, then go knock your socks, knock knock yourself out. The problem is, and I do say this in the piece, the starting point for the accessories industry for two-channel, let's leave video for a moment. The starting point for two-channel were record players now the problem is and i make no bones about this the problem with record players is that absolutely everything makes a difference yeah and this is tremendously frustrating and it's one of the reasons why when cd came along most sane people went yes Hmm. and and never looked back but if the cartridge is out of out of alignment either vertically or horizontally you're going to hear it if and 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 it works down from there every single incremental point of it makes a difference to performance and it's such a and low I'm, voltage as well Ed, yes that, that makes a huge uh, difference it, indeed it, there is there's a lot to be said for paying some attention to wiring when you're dealing with a millivolts ver, you know two millivolts worth of signal however this has if you like ballooned in as into a you know a very profitable and very significant part of the industry yeah so, so Iron- I, I think to, to set the to set it out properly so so people know where we're coming from um so what we're talking about here is when manufacturers and companies take things too far now when you're in the analog world that ed's talking about so turntables and speakers and speaker cable and all the rest of it there there is a certain degree uh, with analog audio where things do make a difference and uh, there are not huge differences apart from turntables so we'll put turntables to one side everything else analog wise c- uh, in terms of connections and so on it can make some difference especially ground loops and all that kind of thing when it comes to power mm. and all the rest of it those can be issues um, but they're issues that can be dealt with in a cost effective manner they don't have to cost tens of thousands so it's the same as HDMI cables at the minute as long as you have a well built cable that reaches the the speeds that uh, that it should be able to reach and it's well put together and it's and, it, and it's it's sturdy and it does its job up to uh, 5 meters anyway there shouldn't be a huge difference when you get longer lengths you really need to be paying attention to uh, how it's been tested and so on electrical currents and that kind of thing um, but apart from that there shouldn't be any difference. And it's the same for the analogue world. There are differences, but it shouldn't cost you an arm and a leg to solve the issues that do exist or could exist. So, By and large. So now that we've got that uh, level of where, where things should be, this is where things start to get a bit silly. Well, the biggest problem, I mean, this, the piece covers. the big, I mean, for, as far as we're, con- we're concerned, um, Royal We... But there is an element that if you are dealing, once you move into the world of network hardware, 
I mean, my network, admittedly, it's in a very cut down state in my granny annex, but some of the cabling involved in this uh, were, was made by me using a big reel of RJ45 <laughs> and RJ45 crimping tool. Yeah. Uh, and it works. It works every single time. It, 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 is, it is not a point of fault. And <clears throat> if I can do all the manner of my usual networking requirements via these cables it becomes something of a stretch to then ask why I might be encouraged to spend a significant amount more on audio file branded networking hardware and USB cables I mean uh, you know I, I, as I say in the piece I, I have this bizarre halfway house in review equipment where uh, you know El Cheapo things that turned up in boxes and, and so on and so forth, USB cables will connect DACs, but then actually you'll get quite posh cables come out of the back of the DAC into into the rest of the equipment because old habits die hard. Yeah. And it's <clears throat> it's the question I suppose in terms of the that part of the industry's long term survival is we've got a clutch of people arriving into you know taking things from their start points of headphones, Bluetooth loudspeakers uh, other wireless transmission systems they are if you like completely non-starters they're complete non-starters in, in, in terms of their, um, the, their their exposure and interest to audiophile cabling yeah. and I don't know if this is this, you know if you like this is a sort of a, a, a catastrophe point that hasn't quite been spotted yet or whether they, you know, there will be the more enterprising things out there, uh, the more enterprising organisations out there who will find a way around this. I mean, that's a, that's a, an interesting one to, to to ponder and one I don't know the answer to. There is one other thing I'm going to say in defence, I suppose, if you like, of all cables, uh, all of our cables, and that includes ones being sold for video, where I make no no bones about in agreeing with you that they have no performative advantage. A number of items in the hi-fi industry are sold as being lifetime items. I mean, that most audiophile cables actually come with a lifetime warranty. Um, they are... I, I, I don't want to guess, get into trouble here. They are highly margined products on the understanding that you're only ever going to buy them once. Unlike so almost anything else in our systems, they are being sold from day one with the basic premise of an unlimited lifespan. Yeah, you know, that's fair enough. And build quality in the materials used. If you want to spend £2,000 on an analogue inter interconnect, um, and it's it's beautifully built and all the rest of it. Do that, but do it on the understanding that it's probably not going to make a difference to the sound quality. Well, there is that definitely. Um, the other thing is um, that on there's on a prosaic level as well as the performative benchmarks that you spoke about earlier. I have to be honest, if you are in any danger of having to change over your speakers or go near the back of your amplifier on a, on a are remotely uh, uh, have you know it, it's not going to be something that can just sit there once pushed back fitting four mil plugs to your speaker cables i don't necessarily believe there's going to be any performance advantage to that whatsoever but my god it makes your life yeah, easier absolutely. <laughs> um, absolutely so you know that uh, and the other thing and i make n i i also have no secret and i have no problem admitting this i will miss if it if this does mark the beginning of the end of some of the more wacky parts of this i will miss the showmanship I mean, the sheer, the, the, you know, selling stuff of this nature is an art as much as a science. Writing the literature for it, doing the Dems for it, all yeah. the rest of it. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it, and that makes it, uh, it's a, I admire the magic of it. I mean, as I say, at Bristol, I had the demonstration of the, the psychic energy projectors, which sit on top <laughs> of your speakers and were made to make you feel better as you listen. And I just, did, I mean, I just admired the sheer audacity. Yeah. audacity of yeah. it. I like the wooden but blocks I'm, that work at a quantum level, apparently. That, that well, was brilliant. Yeah, I'm what? glad that you chimed back in, Steve, because do you remember, I mean, obviously we're coming up to Bristol again, but do you remember last year with the mystery, the mystery goo? Yeah. 
which annoyingly, it despite both work. of us sat there <laughs> going, this isn't going to make any difference at all. And also, I mean, it comes down to it being like a pen and teller thing because uh, the way it's set up is that they, you can you can see that no other adjustment is made to the equipment at all. But presumably there has to be. But yeah. I don't know how it's done. But nonetheless, we sat there in a room where a, a mystery fluid was applied to connectors and they it, the, 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 there was an audible performative difference. Yeah. It's just a world... It is a ma- I will miss that magic because it's great. Uh, there was definitely some sleight of hand going on. It may have involved a bottle of beer and a, a, a pork <laughs> pie in my case. <laughs> you know, I, it wasn't that I was expecting any difference at all. I was expecting no difference. So was he playing the same track or, or yes, was there a bit yeah, of slight yeah, hand? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. And, and as I say, and I don't, I can't, what annoys me is I can't tell you why that, you know, and it doesn't make any sense at all. Mm. So, uh, in, in, but, I mean, in terms of great demonstration, that's that's, that's up there with the best of them. Yeah. So, I, I appreciate, though, that people have had their eyes opened and this is the whole point of doing, you know, articles like this and discuss it on the podcast if you want to go and buy into this stuff and all the rest of it that's your choice and we we are not saying that you're silly or stupid or anything like that we're not in any way saying just do it with your eyes open and ask pertinent questions you know does this make sense um how can how can a power supply suddenly give you better black levels on a tv you it, you can't you know you're talking about gobbledygook there um and it's keeping your eyes open um, when you're dealing with things like this and asking pertinent questions and, and thinking, does this logically make any sense? When you get into what you're talking about there, Ed, it's harder and harder to, to say, you know... To explain the, the trees. Exactly, <laughs> and, and, exp- and explain things like that. But, you know, do it with your eyes open and, and just say, look, you know, say, say to yourself, how can this be possible? Another thing is that myself and Steve, certainly, I don't know about your past, Ed, but we've been to Air Studios... We've been to Abbey Road Studios on numerous occasions, been to Galaxy Studios, we've been to a number of other studios that I can't think of, of Skywalker Ranch. Um, so I've been to all these places myself personally, and I have taken an interest in the cable that they are using to cable up the, the boards, to cable up the speakers, to cable up the microphones and all the rest of it. And what you're talking about is a quality of cable that is slightly higher than bell wire, but not by much. They're not using fancy you know, plated cables and all the rest of it and and gold connectors and all this kind of thing. And and this is yeah, where they, they are give monkeys, Yeah. They? <laughs> this is where they are recording and mixing and and putting these albums together and putting these film soundtracks together and all the rest of it. And as long as it works and as long as it's getting the signal through and they don't take uh, a bit of notice and, and I've sat there when they've been cutting vinyl at, at um Air Studios and asking the guys, you know, uh, when you're listening back through the, the B&W speakers, um, what speaker why are you using? And they couldn't tell me. And I went and had a look, and it was the kind of stuff that you would expect to pay maybe four or five quid a, a metre for at, at Richard Sounds. You know, it was nothing special. It wasn't these big, fat cables that you see in some of the photos. Size of a hose pipe. Yeah. None of that stuff going on. So no, no, there won't be. <clears throat> Equally, I've been to a studio in Germany where everything on the desk was linked to a master clock which isn't that unusual in studio terms that's fine but the master clock in question had a rubidium oscillator and had to be kept behind a sheet of relatively sturdy metal to stop you getting you know you stray poison. radioactive <laughs> particles coming off it so, so it they, an atomic they, clock. All, they had an atomic clock timing the studio bench which um i <laughs> in, in you know it, it's good it's good to know that there are elements of the pro industry who are who are just just as balls out as, <laughs> as, as uh, that's great when the Sorry. drummer's out of time then isn't it <laughs> <laughs> go and sit by the clock until you feel better or hot or itchy one or the other yeah <laughs> so, so, so i guess to, to to wrap up on this piece we've, we've all heard the stories and all the rest of it and and if you're unsure, ask on the forums because the you know you will get good replies on the forums. You know, people. Can I also just very quickly say that there were 273 comments to this, and <laughs> it must be said for the most part, it was it continued in the spirit to which the piece was intended. And uh, yes, there were. I mean, ultimately, I, I I need to point out that we're constrained by a continued desire to not antagonise absolutely every single last corner of this. And there's, and there's no so, need to do that because because yes. I think where the silliest stuff happens 
is not in the mainstream. It's with, um, and, and I'm not going to name them because I don't want to give them any publicity, but there's certain cable companies and that kind of thing that that uh, do advertise elsewhere on the internet and will charge you £2,500 for a one-metre inter- interconnect. Mm-hmm. Um you know, this this is. I couldn't care less if we annoy people like that because well, there is that. because those are ta- those are people who are taking advantage. Everything else in the industry, more or less, is is fair. And what you're paying for, you normally, and what they tell you you're paying for normally is the quality of of the product that you are buying, um, how it's built, the materials used, and all the rest of it. I think we've managed now to get away from. The, the spotless claims that it's going to improve your black levels, the motion's going to be better on your TV, the, you know, you're going to hear better highs and better mids. And, and I think we've gotten away from that in the mainstream. I think we've gotten yeah. away from a lot of that. And I think the consumer's a lot more clued up now um, to these things. And certainly AV Forum's members are, you know, as soon as something like this comes to market, you know, the questions and the right questions are asked and, and people look at it closely. And if you've got any uh, issues uh, at all, if you're not a, a forums regular or whatever, then go to the forums and ask questions and or have a look around, look at the FAQs and so on, because I've no doubt that questions that you've got have been asked and answered many, many times. So if it's too good to be true, it usually is. That's probably the best way to look at it. That being said, if anyone listening to this does have a cop an issue of the Peter Belt Morphic Link bookmark... I will. I'd probably be prepared to pay a tenner just to have one of those, just for the sheer joy of it. As I explained in the piece, that's something that improves the sound of your hi-fi because you put it in your dictionary adjacent to the word link. <laughs> <laughs> and frankly, yeah. I just, I, I just, you know, it's got to be said. If you're going to do it, go big. Okay. And that that you know that that is there. So if anyone does know where I can get a Peter Belt Morph- Morphic Link bookmark, I, I I I well I need a bookmark anyway. I'm continuously using old Tesco receipts in my books, so I figure I might as well upgrade. Yeah. So yeah. And at the end of the day, we live in a capitalist society. I am sure the snake oil uh, will be back in one form or another. I'm sure we we haven't seen the last of it. It's just it won't be as prevalent as it has been in 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 the days before the internet and when audio was analog. Um, Differently and, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely right. So let's move on. Ed, your vinyl album playlist of the month, please. Right, okay, uh, I'll do this quickly because we're obviously way over time. Uh, right, vi- uh, album of the month, you should all be listening to the new uh, one from uh, Rival Sons. Sorry, I had a moment, a brief moment there, but I don't want to talk about that because uh, I want you all to listen to the Weezer cover album because I've listened to it eight times now and I can't work out if it's the greatest or worst thing I've ever heard in my life. And I still, <laughs> still don't know. So you all need to listen to it as well. It's on all the major streaming services. They um they 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 broke us in gently because they released their cover of Toto's Africa last year, um and the rest of them have all been added now. Um I'll I'll give you the track listing in full uh just so you can um you know uh, judge it on its own uh, potential merits. Uh we've got uh, obviously Africa kicks off. Everybody Wants to Rule the World, the Tears for, for Fear song, Sweet Dreams, Eurythmics, Take on Me by Aha, Happy Together by The Turtles, Paranoid by Black Sabbath, Mr. Blue Sky by ELO, No Scrubs by TLC, that's a particular highlight, uh, Billie Jean by Michael Jackson, and uh, Stand By Me, Benny King. So just listen to it and provide honest feedback in the comments. I honestly can't work out exactly where I sit on that album right now. So yeah, uh, and it's just there for your there for your delectation vinyl release is not a new album new album has been a bit quiet this month uh however if you are a fan of uh well where dance music ends and other things begin uh one of the very uh, a very very influential album by uh, a group called burial and they're out the album is their first album so it's imagined simply called burial has been repressed uh it was released in 2006 so first pressings are cost a fortune um and it was repressed very briefly about 18 months ago those sold out in a heartbeat they've repressed it again it is available in fairly limited quantities from specialist retailers but it's absolutely bloody marvelous and if you wanted to know where some of the embryonic parts of sort of the grime and dubstep scenes and stuff like that this is 
this is a genesis moment it's a truly extraordinary thing to listen to it's on all the streaming services as well but as a vinyl release it sounds fantastic and they've done a really good job on the packaging so get yourself stuck into that and playlist is once again tidal because tidal's doing all the donkey work with playlists i'm afraid um i said in the past i'm a huge fan of world music uh, and i don't mind admitting that in public to people um Tidal's done a playlist called World Cafe, music from around the globe. And it is exactly that. It's got some up and coming artists. It's mostly reasonably new things, but from all the different places, uh, lots and lots of different things. As a result of that, you aren't going to like all of it. I certainly don't. But it should point you in the direction of some artists that otherwise you may not have ever heard of or get the opportunity to listen to. And you can start digging down into their stuff as well it's a it's a damn good listen to just have on in the background and um one of the things about world music is that it's almost exclusively brilliantly recorded as well so you can enjoy it in that sense there you go those are my things excellent uh i'll search them out and i'll i'll have a listen thanks well for you all me. need to li- you all need to listen to the weezer cover album I, i'm not uh, it's an instruction it's not a suggestion because i just need to i i honestly can't tell what it is at the moment and i just need external feedback okay uh well, we shall do that for you and we'll report back on the next podcast um okay so that wraps up hardware news we'll be back in a sec with movie news and reviews okay so end of the month we need to talk about film of the month. I uh, am going to ban myself from this because I haven't seen anything uh, in January. Haven't been to the cinema. Have you been to the cinema, Steve? No. Okay, so this so is going to UCAS. Over UCAS. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way he didn't even ask me. <laughs> yeah, we kind of got that now. Yeah, it's got to be Destroyer. I, I haven't seen Vice yet, and uh, Netflix is not not doing it for me this month. So it's um it's got to be Destroyer. It's my my film of the month. That's Nicole Kidman's latest, where she goes ugly. She she uh, well actually it's not a true they're all... because it's uh they do a flip side. They do a flashback um to like fifteen years earlier, where she actually looks more naturally beautiful than she has done in twenty years. I, I don't really know how they achieved that because she's she's looked very um enhanced of late and i i think that they've done it very well to make her younger sort of de-aged self look quite naturally like a younger nicole kidman which i, I didn't think was any longer possible but uh, she uh, does look like a mess in this she is uh, a uh, very tired very bitter, worn-out, hardened L.A. cop. Um, uh, It's a familiar story, but they do it well, and she's on fine form. It's the best thing she's done in years. Um, And uh, that that comes highly recommended. Destroy it, if you can find it. It's it's showing at uh, your latest cinema for one night only at midnight. It's it's a a real... Couldn't couldn't see it in the audience. No, exactly. Uh, alternatively, go and see Vice, because I haven't seen it yet, but it's got rave reviews and uh, it, it looks it looks like a cut another cutting satire on the state of American politics. It looks at Dick Cheney and his Machiavellian um, uh, secret masterminding of the G.W. Bush presidency. Um, it, it, by all accounts, including Kamari's review, um, it looks very good. So I, I, I can't actually wait to see that. And if you want the opposite so bad, it's so uh, it's actually still so bad. Then watch Netflix's Polar. Polar. <laughs> it's uh, it's I I think it would take a few people watching it, you know, with a lot of beers to see whether they can get some enjoyment out of just how. So you didn't go and see Glass. It. I haven't seen Glass yet. I I was itching to see it to the point where I watched, rewatched Unbreakable, rewatched Split, loved then Split, read the reviews. <laughs> lo- loved the twist on Split. I couldn't get to see it to review, so uh, so it, it ended up going to Kamari, who reviewed it and gave it a fairly severe review. Um, and it wasn't the only but, one. 
<laughs> but yeah, between that and everybody else, I just thought, uh, having watched the other two recently, do I really want my memory of them to be spoilt by watching Glass? But I'm I'm really disappointed that it's... Is this M. Night Shyamalan again? Yeah. yeah. And, Shyamalan and he, Ding Dong. He Have did you, really um... well to do Split because no one saw that coming. I watched I watch Split and had no idea it was part of the Unbreakable Universe. And it works really well. I haven't seen it yet. Thanks for spoiling did, that. Did Split come before or after uh, the Deadly Trees one? After. Split is his latest film, but for Glass. Right. And it, it's it's a very nicely done psychological horror film. It's, As it's, opposed to the one with the killer trees, which is shite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Split's got like a right at the very end. The only the highlight for the Killer Trees thing, spoiler, is the bloke with a lawnmower. But that's, <laughs> one of the, that's one of the funniest things I've seen. I don't suppose it, it, it doesn't quite have the, uh, the, the, the the horror vibe that I think they were gunning for. It's just brilliantly hilarious. Uh, so, um, yeah, that was no, the it's, last. It's a terrible, terrible film um, with an awful performance from, from uh, Marky Mark. Mark Wahlberg. Yeah. Marky uh, Mark. <laughs> and the Funky Bunch. Um yeah, it's dreadful. Uh, Split's good. Split's good. James McAvoy's um, always watchable. Um, and I like Unbreakable, even though it's slow as Treacle Burn. You, you know what? I bought uh, Split in Fries last year, and I still haven't watched it. It's still saying <laughs> not much about it. It's well, good. It's good. But, yeah, but... it's only an hour and a half. It's a cheeky hour and a half. Get in there. Oh, yeah. No yeah, excuse. Yeah. No excuse. But yes, I haven't tarnished it yet with glass. I think I might wait for 4K to be imposed upon me to to go through all of that and may, maybe with all of these horrendous reviews i'll watch it and go ah, it's that making good awesome. money though it's made like 160 million on a 20 million budget so it's long established there's no pattern to this yeah <laughs> yeah okay there, there uh, is no god <laughs> if 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 some of us are going to go to the cinema the next week and that's including up to the 6th of february because there is a, a midweek opening um what can we go and see you cars Right, so we've got uh, another Escape Room film. I'm pretty sure that over the last couple of years there have been two or three films by the title Escape Room, which, again, I'm pretty sure are under the premise that it's cool to make a horror film about escape rooms. So we've got another Escape Room horror film, which has already done phenomenally well in the States, made $50 million off a $9 million budget. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, OK, you can go and see that. Um, How to Train Your Dragon Hidden World it's the third of the main How to Train Your Dragon films not counting about six different TV shows and shorts and spin-offs um, and there's also a Melissa McCarthy film Can You Ever Forgive Me a slightly different drama for her to do about um, some uh, artistic art, art license forgeries, isn't it? Yeah, forgeries. Uh, letter, for, letter, forging letters yeah, with oh, Richard E. Grant. It's, I mean, it's based on a true story, someone who, uh, down and out writer who thought they could make some money off forging letters from famous people, um, uh, which obviously went exceedingly well until it didn't. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so there's that. Um, I, I'd actually go for Green Room, which is out, I think, Wednesday. Green Room. Ah, it's a mistake everyone's making. Green Book, which is out Wednesday, which is the one that's um, up for a bunch of Oscars. Uh, Vigo Mortensen, and I'm going to get his name right, Mahara. Mortensen? Char- Vigo Mortensen. Vigo Mortensen. Vigo Sorry, I, I, yeah, I, I haven't had the pleasure yet. Uh, and Mahara... Charles. Oh yeah, he's unpronounceable there. name. Okay, um, Marish- Marishala Ali or something like that. Yeah, let's go with that. He's um, he's recently in True Detective season three, very which he's brilliant in. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Green Book is supposed to be excellent, and we should have a, a re- review of that shortly. Um, that would be my vote. And early next week. No, no, no. I've just realised we've got a podcast on the second of February, so we can save it till the end. <laughs> Okay. Steve, anything there that you, you going to go and see? I'm going to go and see Alita. Oh, we're not talking about that, are we? No, no. Um, <laughs> I fancy Green Book, but uh, I'll probably just get the disc. 
because I think it's out on, on 4K disc uh, fairly soon in the States because it came out in the States a lot sooner. Right. So I think I'll just pick that up. But I do fancy it. The weird thing, I can't. It's being tipped as a possible Oscar winner. It won the Producers uh, Guild Award uh, a week ago. Um, it was directed by Peter Farrelly, <laughs> the guy that made this something about Mary. Yes. <laughs> so it, I find well, this staggering that the guys that made, you know, some really, really, you know, really pure art movies is now being hotly tipped as an Oscar contender. Well, you're going yes. to start somewhere. So it's like a Peter Jackson. Um, although he's completing his circle, isn't he? Yeah, he's going back. Um, <laughs> but, um, but no, that, that, that's fair enough. But can we also note that actually you, you guys were entirely correct. It, it must be said that um, that Mortal Engines thing has, um, has, has, has bombed pretty impressively. It, it's, um, it, it's noteworthily sort of failed to meet any and all expectations so mm-hmm. that's um yeah i didn't yeah. didn't bother with that yeah. i don't I, think I that think was advertised that properly i think that's that's what where something like glass has succeeded Did you not just think it was a shit movie cars doesn't matter it doesn't matter transformers movies make money bumblebee's it, they just have to be, be quite good actually yeah <laughs> apart from bumblebee bumblebee's actually a good movie yes but um but it, it i think that it promotion and advertising make a huge amount of difference and mortal engines doesn't mean anything to me i i'm i've i might have seen the poster uh, i certainly don't remember it's difficult seeing... to promote a film about moving cities it just looks stupid yeah and, and also the not, idea and no mortal mortal engines it just sounds like a biopic of the rover cave series it's just <laughs> me. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> that's a very in joke but you yeah, know, yeah. That's, uh... right so that's cinema wise i like to say we'll come back to alita next week because i'd, I'd forgotten we're doing a podcast on Friday so there we go um, this is the unusual thing we're recording on a Sunday night you get all out of sync uh, anyway Blu-ray releases uh, Steve we'll go to you for these okay well we've got The Predator um, the new Predator movie from Shane Black which I saw at the cinema and is a bit of a mess unfortunately um, I love Shane Black but I don't know what the hell he did to Predator any but any extended I, cuts or anything on disc uh, no I've actually got the disc I've had it for a while I haven't got around to watching it yet um, partly because I saw it at the cinema and, and I wasn't that bothered, but uh, it was a lot. There was a lot of studio interference. He it had a completely different ending originally, uh, and this is a film that looks like there's large chunks missing. I think you said it in your review, Kaz. Mm. It, you just feel like this, this, this whole bit. Yeah. Like they suddenly they've got an RV, and you're like, where did that come from? This, this is the it's massive that, jumps yeah. in logic. It, yeah. Um, um, yeah, it's a big disappointment. I was looking forward to this film, and I was bitterly disappointed when I saw it. Uh, Mile 22, I've not seen. It's on Blu-ray and DVD. But you I have. You have seen it, haven't you? Um, yeah. Mediocre. Um, I, you know what? I can't remember anything about it. <laughs> Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch again. It though, was, it? it was Marky Mark, yeah. It, it was okay. I mean, it did what it, it said on the tin, basically. I mean, it wasn't anything that you haven't seen before. Very formally. I think and, it's Peter um, Berg who makes you know, fairly competent action yeah, films. Yeah. Um, we've also got The Clock with, sorry, The House with a Clock. I emphasize the clock in its walls. <laughs> Uh, on DVD and Blu-ray I've, I, and 4K disc. Oh, is that not coming out on 4K disc? It is coming out on 4K. Yeah, because I've got the 4K disc from the States. Again, I've had that for weeks. I haven't got around to watching it yet. Are you um, still buying everything on 4K? No, but... Uh, this Why is, did you uh, buy this? I don't know. I fancied it. I like... Um, well, it was, it, was, it was... I just wanted to see if Eli Roth could make a kid's movie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, it's Eli Roth, director. Um, it's a short, based on, I think it's based on a children's book. It's, it stars uh, Jack Black and Kate Blanchett. Um, and uh, it's about wizards, I think, wizards and witches. So, uh, sounded fun. Little Drummer Girl uh, on DVD. Is that on Blu-ray as well? Just DVD? Um, that's They're not doing anything on Blu-ray. The, DV, the, the, TV, mini, the TV miniseries uh, based on the book by John Le Carre, which I watched when it was on TV and I thought was really good, actually. Uh, cracking cast and, and a good slow burn um, thriller. And also interesting, it's not a Cold War one. It's slightly different. It's about the Palestinian war. So it's a good 70s detail to it as well. I thought it was really good. And it's directed by, what's his face, the Korean director. Which Park is Yeah, thank you. Uh, also, The Wife... Uh, is this the one with Glenn Close? It is. Yeah. Well, and she's, Stanley she's Tucci. Being, she's being tipped uh, for Oscar glory on this one as well. Her or Olivia Colman, one or the other. Um, that's available on DVD and Blu-ray. Have not seen it. Have you seen it, Kaz? I have not seen it. And I've got this terrible feeling. Oh, yeah, it is Glenn Close. It is. Yeah. And Jonathan Price, not Stanley Tucci. Jonathan Price and Glenn Close. Mm-hmm. And well, then Olivia Colman's come a long way from acting as filler in Mitchell and Webb sketches. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, to uh, potentially winning the Oscar for Best Actress. She's already got three BAFTAs. I mean, um, don't get me wrong, she was. She I mean, I, I don't. 
I don't want to, you know, don't want to downplay that. Like so many great people who are great on screen, she was effortlessly brilliant at filling in what needed to be filled in for Mitchell and Webb, but it's still quite an extraordinary journey in its own right. I just wanted to... And finally, we've got Reign of the Supermen uh, on DVD Blu-ray and Steelbook. Um, Not seen that, Kaz, over to you. (laughs) It's a sequel to The Death of Superman. So the the animated series of DC animated movies uh, hit its, like, 20th anniversary, and they decided to remake the first ever one. The first one they did was Superman Doomsday. And in Superman Doomsday, they offered a condensed version of the two-part story, which is the death of Superman and the reign of the Superman. And uh, the DC animated studios decided they'd revisit the material and tell it as two parts, uh, which for people who haven't seen it, it's great to get a longer version, but people who've seen Superman Doomsday, it's the same story. Superman fights Doomsday and they both die. And then the reign of the Superman is about the Superman who pop up afterwards but we all kind of know what happens when superman and i'm doing the air commas now dies when any comic book character dies they come back at some point yeah but superman's just got a knack of did you guys forgot to just shine some sunlight on him because because that'll do it um so I, i don't know why they have any any time wasted on that yeah you lost me about five minutes ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's the Blu-ray 4K disc releases coming up. Oh, discs of the month. I actually bought some this month, but they were older releases that had been out for a while. Does that count? If so, I'm going to say 2001. I picked that up when I was in Vegas. I haven't watched, sat and watched the whole thing. I've sat and watched bits and pieces of it um, because I've said been busy testing equipment. I've got to say it looks utterly, utterly, utterly brilliant. I can't remember the last time I saw a transfer look as good as this. Yeah, no, it is brilliant. I mean, obviously it was shot to p- perfectly to start with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then taking the 65mm film and scanning it at 8K and then bouncing it down to 4K, the results are just stellar. Yeah, um, yeah. No, no pun intended. Um, so, yeah, it's a brilliant disc. My, yeah. my favourite disc of the month is um, Waterworld. I think that's a cracking yeah. release from, from Arrow. Three versions of the film. You get the Ulysses cut, which is the extended cut without any little cuts for TV that were made. Um, we've got the uh, special, the ending where they realise they're on Mount Everest at the end, which somehow ignores the fact that they would have been about 30,000 feet and dead from a lack of oxygen. But anyway, there's not a lot of logic to Waterworld because um, even if all the ice caps did melt, you only raised the water, water level by about 27 feet. Um, but I still like the film <laughs> and it's a great transfer and it looks gorgeous and you get the money's on screen um, it may have cost a lot but it's up there on screen and um, yeah I, I've got a soft spot for the film and also it's got a uh, making up documentary that's an hour and 45 minutes long and it's yeah, really good you've sold me I'm going to go and get it no go get it it's really good it's really good Cash you reviewed it didn't you I did I loved it yeah Mad Max on Water yeah Mad Max on Water yeah, yeah. with the same cinematographer as Mad Max in fact <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I thought it was yeah, and the same basic plot except yeah. on water. I thought yeah, and, and, and just, just, just when you realise it's, it's pre CGI days, so like they they built an atoll, <laughs> they built yeah. a giant atoll, and you know they they you know, there's a whole stuff with this with the supercar with the Exxon Valdez and stuff. You know, it's all real done for real, and um, yeah, it looks great. Yeah, I, I thoroughly really... enjoyed the uh, the show that used to be on at Universal as well. That yeah, excellent. yeah, that's fantastic. still going. Still going. Is it really? Is it's it still, still going. Yeah. Right. Is it five different locations worldwide? That's really popular. <laughs> yeah, that no, was an excellent show. Brilliant. You, th- you think the plane's going to hit you? to popular opinion, it did not lose money. Yeah, it did make its money back. So, Kaz, you've seen a shed load of discs uh, this month. What was your favourite? Uh, it's got to be Waterworld, like Steve says. All right, that's the be- okay. best release of the month. We've only oh, had... uh, well, there's one other good one. Sorry, uh, so, so again, Arrow. Um, they, they, I did enjoy their release of Crimson Peak as well. But if you've got the original release, uh, it's not massively different. Um, you get, you get again, you get a making of documentary. Um, but the film, as far as I can tell, the film and the soundtrack are just straight ports from the original release, anyway. Yeah, I'm not really sure why they did that. It's got a nice book, though. It comes with a nice book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah no, sorry, that's the reason why we didn't cover that one. But um, yeah, it's I, not... think, I think it's been an odd month because the first 4K releases we had were um, this week for Crazy Rich Asians and Simple Favour. 
This yeah, week. I, I was... it's always, but it's a quiet month for all media. I mean, as I say, vinyl releases have been pretty quiet. Yeah. Well, I think so. it gets to the premise that no one's going to buy anything after Christmas. But even on on this week coming, we've got Predator and House of the Clock in the Walls. I mean, it's not it's not a great month for uh, for talking about your best disc. It's got to it's got to probably come down to Waterworld. I mean, there aren't even any all time classics out. Um, it, the the best service that any film has been done this month is is Waterworld. Yeah. Okay, so so in in that respect, then what are we looking forward to? Then what's been announced or what's been teased that that is coming, especially four K wise, Steve? I mean, I know you you cover um, Bill at, at Digital Bits quite a bit, and Bill's always up to Bill Hunt. He's always up to speed with what's coming. So what is the well? Rumored... I, I know what I've got on order um, over the next three months. So I mean, I've got a couple of discs that are actually arriving any day uh, tomorrow with a bit of luck. Uh, First Man, which I'm really looking forward to getting because I, I enjoyed that at the cinema, and I, I think the soundtrack alone is going to sound stellar in in, uh, in Dolby Atmos. Plus, you've got the different film stocks and the stuff at the end being shot on IMAX footage. So that's that's out soon. Um, I've got that on order. Uh, Halloween, the the sequel, the <laughs> the new sequel to the original Halloween, um, also called Halloween, which is shouldn't it have been called Halloween Two, but there's already a Halloween Two. Um, got that coming, which I'm looking forward to. And um, I actually there's a film coming out. This is really annoying because I don't want to buy it, but uh, I'm going to have to buy Robin Hood, even though I've got no interest in the film because Lionsgate yeah, released it's a one. both it's, yeah. Dolby Vision and HDR10+. Yeah, I'm going to have to buy it as well. So it'll be a handy <laughs> test. Disc. Um, film I've actually got already. Uh, it's not out in the UK yet, but I came out in the States at the beginning of the month, and uh, I did really enjoy it. It was Bad Times at the El Royale. Yeah, uh, it's which, great. Which movie. is also the first uh, HDR10+. plus. Um, this not counting the All IMAX right. enhanced releases. Well, you see, that was uh, that was on the plane, and I thought, no, I'll, actually, I want to see that properly, so I, I didn't watch fun. it. That was good fun. I really enjoyed that. Um, what else is coming out in the next uh, next couple of months? Well, we've uh, got... Star is born, got coming soon uh, next month in February. In, Indiana Jones is definitely not coming. That was yeah. Uh, Rumors that Aliens coming in Feb in uh, April, and that Captain Alien. America is coming in February. Yep. Um, oh, well. Yes, I mean Captain America: The First Avenger. They haven't put that out for pre-order anywhere, though, have they? Uh, well, there's the, I'm seeing rumours though, the 26th of February in the states, at least. Mm. I'm guessing elsewhere as well. Um, that would make sense. They're trying to sort of tie a few releases in with um, Captain Marvel, and yeah, Alien in April, apparently the yep. original Alien, Ooh, uh, yes. which would be brilliant. Which <laughs> yeah, is up true. for pre-order. It is up for pre-order, isn't it? Yeah, that's a, that's uh, another one, another one like T two with that I have owned on probably every single format I've ever really had, yes. and you're going to keep going. Well, yeah. you know what, Alien is amazing though. It's honestly, apart from uh, the displays on the TV screen, you know, the computer displays, yeah. that film could have been made yesterday. It's that really aged, aged mm. really well. Mm. That and the what? Will the, um, the, the, the amount of moisture on the ship? Well, oh, that's just atmospheric. That's just a, no. That's fine. It, 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 it's it's uh, still one of the. Actually, not. you're wrong. You're wrong. The scene you're talking about is when it's all dripping from above, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, just in general. That, in that a, level, a level of relevant <laughs> he's, humidity. He's in the air part too. of the ship where the where the landing feet are, and the reason they're dripping water is quite sensible because they've been outside in the atmosphere, haven't they? That's it's just condensation. Makes perfect sense. Now that film is genius. <laughs> Every frame. I've got to say that it, it's one of it. It's one of the first films that took its time with its opening. Um, Back yeah. in the they did that. Yeah, uh, and built up tension, and and the life cycle of the alien was really carefully thought out. Yeah. Its its rationale, its reasoning was was sensible, and they behaved like professionals. They thought, right, what are we going to do to get rid of this thing? And how he went from that to making things like Prometheus and particularly Alien Covenant. Yeah, God, it's you because know, that is C- cinematography as well. I mean, I, I'm talking about like the oh, opening minutes of that film it. as as it's moving around the ship as they're sleeping, and the cameras walking you through the through the Score. the ship. Brilliant by Jerry yeah. Goldsmith. It's just a it's just a brilliant film from beginning to end. The cast, yeah. perfectly cast movie. Um some really good twists in it. Uh and the monster itself, apart from when they finally show it all at the end, it's a bit not crap. But, Man but in suit, that, yeah. but maybe did, sure. he just uh ghost directed the last few movies. That would explain a lot. Like, I think if he, he died as ghost director, that would explain it more. No, I I think <laughs> I think with any creative you have your hot period and then once it's gone it's gone and you're still creative and you're still making things that are, are interesting and so on but I think if you look at any any director and I'm talking about some of the greats as well like Kubrick and so on they have their hot period and then everything else is 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 good but not quite as good as yeah, the masterpieces. I, I, I can see that I can see like, I can see Spielberg with his uh, doing the barrels 
and even all of the work you did on indie, a lot of it's practical, a lot of it's stunts, a lot of it's impressive. And then Crystal Skull, when you've got a lot yeah. of money yeah. and you've got a lot of effects. And I, I, I get what you mean, because Alien was made at a time when they had to skimp on everything, when they had to avoid too many shots yeah. of the Alien. Yeah, when you no, had to be clever. You know, they yeah, just, yeah so you had to be clever. Yeah. And now they've got, you've got all the money, you can put anything on the screen, and you, 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 know, you get the... the just, the, just be thing. grateful that Ridley Scott didn't make um, Blade Runner 2049. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. yeah. thank God someone else wrote it and we got a good film. <laughs> Yeah, and and the more that I watch that film, and I have it's watched really it numerous good. times, it gets better massive. and better and better, yeah. and it and it yeah. is going to be a modern classic. It's a worthy Absolutely. sequel. Yeah. It's a worthy yeah. sequel, and it's beautifully made too. Right. So let's uh, let's wrap up on the podcast. Then let's look at TV shows and streaming series of the month. Kaz has been <laughs> seeing loads of these, so let's go to Kaz first because uh, you've been putting in the work, Kaz. You've been watching the shit, so we don't have to. So, <laughs> so there must have been some gems in there that you've seen. Uh, so tell us about them. What TV show wise this month? TV shows or streaming series? Yeah. If we want to do, uh, if we, yeah, I mean, it's been excellent. We've had uh, Titans finally hit Netflix. Now that's the Teen Titans. Don't let it put you off. It's one of the most adult, brutal, violent, uh, well, well thought out, well structured, and well acted things from DC. They've done a really good job. I mean, if they'd done this for Suicide Squad. It would have been really heralded as as a game changer. Yeah. So so Titans is. I've, well I've, worth I've got to say it's a shame that Mark Brotwright's not in the podcast and and get well soon, Mark. He's got a bad back at the minute. Um, but he he was banging on about Teen Titans and I actually watched it on the plane. <laughs> Uh, Teen Titans goes to and the it was, movie, which is obviously it was different. brilliant. It was brilliant. Yeah. It was abs- and, uh, It's a shame Mark's not here because that was his film of the year, wasn't it? So yeah. it's a shame he's not here because uh, I finally saw it on the plane and it was utterly brilliant. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Go okay. on, guys. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So um, we covered some of these before, but I've got to recommend again The Punisher. Season two of The Punisher, we might not get any more, but... um, We definitely won't get any more. It's a a way to go out on a high. And and we also got the start of the new Star Trek Discovery series, season two. It's had some mixed feedback, but I loved it. And um, I know proper Trekkies are going to... you seen it yet, Steve? It, but... Yeah, I've seen the first two episodes. Um, first of all, scope ratio, now 2.35 to 1. Is it? Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, scope ratio, 2.35 to 1 on the second season, 5.1 soundtrack. Uh, it's got cinema quality production values. It does. Effects. Yeah. It's just, a, it's a move. The one is not bothering to make any Star Trek movies anymore. Why? Because they're putting it up on the screen anyway. Um, if you're a Trekkie, you're probably going to hate it. I'm not a Trekkie, couldn't care less. I really like it. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's okay. great. I need to and catch up with that. And they've got that faux grain that Pl- they put in. Plus, the season. Orville's also back. And again, uh, the last episode I saw, episode three, was spot on. Really, really good. Um, very actually, I was in tears. The ending made me cry. Um, okay. It's uh, yeah, Orville's back, and it's really good too. If you if you're a Star Trek Star Trek fan, that's your more traditional Star Trek actually. Um, but well worth checking out. Season I'd, two. I'd forgotten these are bad, and obviously Family Guy as well. It's back for an, that's another... coming gone. Has it come and gone? Is it? Yeah, Have I missed that? All oh, right. Yeah, you missed that. But the Orville's still there on Now TV, so get in quick right, okay. because it's three episodes in already. Um, but yeah, if you say, so you've got both of those back. Punisher, I'm in hot, just about to finish. Really good. I'm going to go straight on to Titans after I finish the Punisher. Um, True Detective, I think, is brilliant. After a rocky second season, this third season's more like the first season. And it's brilliant the way it's structured in three different time periods. 1980, when they're doing the original investigation, a, a, a review of the investigation in 1990 because of new information becomes available. And then a TV crew interviewing the detective as he's an old man with dementia. Um, trying to remember back in the current time in 2015, trying to remember back over the over the uh, over the investigation, and it, I think it's absolutely brilliant so far. Three episodes. It also in again. presumably doesn't have Vince Vaughn in it, which probably no, is. No, it does not. It has uh, Marish Shala Ali um, in the lead, and he's really good. Plus Stephen Dorff is also excellent. It's got a, it's it's a really really good so far. Stephen Dorff, as in the bloke who was in Blade. Yeah, Stephen yeah. Dorff, and he's good in it. He's, he's he very is, good. Yeah. At this. Uh, it's great. It's good. It's so far, I'm really enjoying it. I, I think it's it's really well written, brilliant, brilliantly acted, uh, and um, yeah, a return to form for True Detective. Yeah, and Vince Vaughn. There's nothing wrong with his serious roles. He, <laughs> he was he was good in True Detective season two. The fact that the season was off wasn't down to him being, you know, like a a tough mob enforcer. I mean, if you see Brawl and Cell Block 99, I've probably got the numbers wrong and the location, but, I mean, he's he's on fierce, 
Punisher style form in that movie. He just um, is intrinsic. One of those people who I in, in just associate with being intrinsically comedic. Have you seen <laughs> Brawl in yeah. Cell Block Ninety Nine? I think, Kaz, we can work on the principle that I've seen. <laughs> I, 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 okay. Yes. In, in, in the same way that if I was to ask you about where your th- what your thoughts on Belgian jazz were, you're probably <laughs> going to be limited. It's, Is it dairy free? <laughs> exactly. It's it's horses for courses. There's there's only so much time to consume the world's media, so you have to you have to take a stand and choose what of the media you're going to consume. Absolutely. So um, so what have you what have you watched, Ed? What's your TV of, of the month? Oh Christ! I've watched barely anything. Um, oh, I know what you have watched because I watched it last night in a recommendation. Fire Festival on Netflix. That actually, no, How that good was is that? absolute. <laughs> that was brilliant. If you haven't seen that yet, the Fire Festival. Watch it. Watch it. It's absolutely what a thing. brilliant. In terms of yeah, it's a, a self-contained television event that's on Netflix. I would love to watch the one that's on Hulu but I have no idea how might one might go about doing that in the UK uh, legally. I need to stress. Um, but no, that's on Amazon, so you might want to try looking there. All right, I'll have a look there. But no, that's that is you're absolutely right, Steve. That is a truly brilliant thing to watch because it has everything. Um, it's and it, it gets it a lot done in ninety minutes. So <laughs> I've been watching the Grand Grand Tour as well. It's fine. I agree with Phil that reducing the amount of time in studio is helpful. I would say that. It's unfortunate that for this double header episode that's just gone for Friday and Saturday because we're recording on the Sunday, they've gone back to South America, which let's mm. not forget was the scene of probably one of their best ever extended episodes whilst under the aegis of the BBC, which, you know, that's an unfortunate thing. Yeah. But it has reminded me that I really, really like an original Fiat Panda 4x4. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. are amazing cars. Yeah, Do you know they're, they're so sought after at the minute that they are appreciating in value um, for some strange I, reason? I do know that. Can I give you an even more astounding statistic? You might like this one. Yeah. That for five uncontested years it was the world's fastest car from 0 to 30 miles an hour <laughs> because someone on one of the UK car magazines worked out that you could wind, literally rev it until it hit the limiter with your foot on the clutch and if you just let your foot off the clutch and with the gear shift in second rather than first it essentially hit 30 miles an hour instantly <laughs> and i do mean that it was faster than a ferrari f40 to 30 miles an hour after that the ferrari had the advantage <laughs> but yeah. um just amazing things yeah. um so I've... that that that's and it's beautifully shot uh, i did watch it in hdr they, they have it. they have uh, improved on that aspect cuz the last season it felt kind of thrown together whereas this time they, they seem to have taken a bit of care a bit of love and attention to the <laughs> cinematography and so on and, and uh, the bit in Detroit I mean some of that looked I, I mean it, it's obviously devastation but it looked be- it had this beautiful look to it you know what I mean it was... well also it must be said just on a ra- random probably not car related note but in the l- the last episode with the hummingbirds that looked mm. absolutely amazing um, but whether that's quite what you're looking for in a car show, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, that's the only bit of TV I've actually seen this month because obviously there's CES and all the rest of it and everything, and I, I just haven't had a chance to sit down and catch my breath and sit and watch any TV other than you know grabbing the Grand Tour when I can. I haven't seen the second part of the uh, the one that's happened over this weekend, so I've still got that to watch. Um, so for me, it's a bit of a, a downer, but I've got loads of great TV lined up there that I can go and watch next month. Yeah. So definitely. I'd just... also quickly recommend on on Netflix again. Um, Conversations with the Killer, um, Ted Bundy Murders. That um, does look quite interesting. That, that's yeah. really, really good. It's in four parts, four hours basically. It's, uh, it's. I mean, I, I knew Ted Bundy was obviously, but um, um, yeah, that goes into the into the murders and in his conversations with a journalist. Um, it's fascinating because he's just not what most serial killers tend to be. Lonely men, 
uh, and they almost always men, white men, um, you know, but they're socially inept. Um, they're pretty sleazy and horrible. Um, Bundy was the exact opposite. He was he was intelligent. He was attractive. He was very charismatic. He had normal relationships with women. You know, he had a girlfriend. He did not look like a serial killer, but he did some appalling things to at least 30 women. Um, and it's uh, it's just a fascinating documentary. So I highly recommend it. Is there any more word on when this BBC War of the Worlds thing is coming out? Well, I don't know, sometime this year. Because <laughs> I have they, to say... have got some big things in the pipeline because they're also doing his dark materials for this year as well, I believe. I am genuinely looking forward to that because it, it, it the H.G. Wells proper in London thing has been very poorly served historically. So if someone can actually do a reasonable take on that, I for one will watch that with some enthusiasm. I might even save some bit where it up and see if it's done in HLG on iPlayer. What can I say? What can, what can we say on that bombshell? Ed talking about HLG. What what's mm. come, what's gone wrong? Happened there. Uh, uh. Anyway, <laughs> uh, that's a, a good point to end this week's podcast. My thanks to Cas Harlow. I've seen you drive, and it's terrifying. Ed Sally. Well, I mean, I guess I could, but. And I'm Steve Withers. Get out of there, skinny boy. Uh, don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, Bookmark AV Forums, so there's reviews, news, and video, and of course, leave us a five star rating on iTunes, but only if you enjoyed the show. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you again next week. Bye.